Good morning. Good morning. Please join me in the call to worship. In a world that oppresses the most vulnerable, praise God who watches over the outcast and stranger. In a world where food is wasted while others live in famine, praise God who food for all. In a world where it can be hard to remain hopeful, Come, let us worship God. (laughs) 
As we light our peace lamp, I invite us to join our hearts together in prayer. Loving God, we come to you once again this day. We humbly come to you once again this day and we pray for peace. We pray for peace in our very souls. We pray for peace in our families, in our communities, in our country, and in our world. In a world that is turbulent, violent at times, there is still goodness, God, and all the goodness comes from you. So God, we ask that that goodness would permeate the hearts and the minds of our leaders all around the world, that they would begin to look at an alternative way of peace, that way of you, the peace that the world cannot understand. We pray for all those who are fighting for peace. We especially lift up those in the 10th Mountain Division, our brothers and sisters, as our neighbors and friends. We lift their families to you, God, and we pray together that there would be a day when loved ones would come home and they would never have to be deployed again because peace, or because war, would be a thing of the past. But for now, in this in-between time, God, we ask that you would continue to bring your peace to this world. And we pray it all in the name of your Son, the Prince of Peace, Jesus the Christ. Amen. May the peace of Christ be with you. Let us offer one another signs of peace. Good morning. Peace be with you. Peace be with you.
please remain, sta remain standing for the opening prayer. Sovereign God of all things good, we gather to recall the great love story of our faith so that we may embody it in our daily lives and share it with future generations. In our worship and in our living, may your love remain ever present. Amen. You all may be seated except kids of any age. I invite you to come on down and join me for a few moments. All right, in a circle. I know. Good morning, everyone. Gerald, I think we're good. We have one thing before we start this morning. A couple weeks ago, do you remember when the firemen came to church and we had fire prevention week? Well, Mr. Jerry has something for us to remember that. They are some coloring books. It, yeah, so um, I want you all to take one of those, and we are thankful for Jerry. He was the one that got the whole thing going with fire prevention. We talked to Mr. Bill, and we got all the firemen, and so let's thank Mr. Jerry, okay? So thank you. There are, okay, now you have to keep them closed till after worship today, okay? Because we don't want them for Sunday school. Now, oh, you don't have Sunday school. Well, then you have to talk to your parents about when you can open them, okay? All right, so question. What do I have in my hand? A quarter. So what is on, let's see, what is on this side? George Washington. So what else do we call that side of the coin? Heads. Heads. So this would be... Tails. Okay, which one is more important, heads or tails? Heads. Why? Because it's George Washington. All right, but... Uh, well, you know what they do in, in, um, in a football game or something? They toss the coin, right, to see who goes first? Well, what happens if the team called tails and it came up tails? Um, I guess that means they don't go first. No, that means they do go first, which means tails would be the more important side of the coin, right? How much tails? Mm -hmm. don't have tails. We're not talking about like cat tails or puppy tails. We're just talking about two sides of the coin. So I guess it's your perspective. Same thing, heads or tails, you can, you can toss a penny. I would prefer you not toss me as a penny. Uh, ha, ha, ha. Oh, that was so bad, I know. Okay, so the perspective is both sides are important, right? Well, Jesus, in our lesson that we are going to hear today, there was a... a a religious leader that asked Jesus out of all the commandments, which one was the most important? Well, Jesus gave two because they were just like this coin. They were both important. The first one was all about loving God with your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. And the other was about loving your neighbor and being kind. Yes, Olivia. What about Canadian money? Well, you can flip it. I, you know, the queen's head is on one side. I'm sure she wouldn't mind having, you know, the coin flipped. And if it's a loony, there's a loony on the other side, and that would be the tail side. And if it's a toonie, then it's a toonie. <laughs> but the more important thing, Olivia, and I do appreciate that you're talking about Canadian money, and we can talk about pound sterling, and we can talk about euros and all those things, but the most important thing is that Jesus said that both sides were important. That loving God and loving others are both this, of the same importance. You can't love one and not the other because they're both fit together. Does that make sense kind of to you guys? Okay, does that make sense out there? Please say yes. yes. Okay, good. <laughs> so let's pray. 
God, we give you thanks for today, and we do give you thanks that out of all the, all the rules, all those 600 rules in the Old Testament, you said that there were two that were forever linked together, that that was to love you with everything and love our neighbor in kind. So as we go through this week, God, may we do that, love our neighbor and love you. And we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys can go back to your seats, and thanks for coming up this morning. And Leah May is going to come up because she has something very important to talk about. Good morning. morning. Our mission minute today is about advocating for Palestinian children who are being abused in Israeli military detention. At our last Upper New York Annual Conference, we United Methodists voted to advocate for Palestinian children. Why would we choose to do that? Jesus teaches us to notice what is happening in our world and work for justice. Five to 700 Palestinian children go through the Israeli military court system each year. Israel is the only country in the world that prosecutes children in military courts. During terrifying night raids of their homes, Palestinian children are often arrested, some as young as seven, most commonly charged with throwing stones, and illegally taken out of the occupied territories into Israel without parents knowing where they're going or when they will return. They are often blindfolded, handcuffed, and verbally and physically abused from the moment of their arrest. In 2016, Israeli military courts began sentencing children over the age of 11 to years in prison for stone throwing with a maximum of 20 years. To enter Israel, parents must have a permit to go into Israel, and it can take months to get a permit. Most child prisoners have no access to lawyers and no adult protection when they are interrogated. Many children are threatened with reprisals against their families, beaten and tortured to force them to confess. Many Palestinian children prisoners cannot read or write Hebrew, and yet the signed confessions are done in Hebrew. So what can we do about it this morning? We have two things we're asking you to do today. First, we'd like you to sign the letters we've prepared in the back to our congressional representative asking our representative to co-sponsor H.R. 4391. This bill was introduced to Congress by Representative Betty McCollum from Minnesota. The intent of the bill is to start a conversation in Congress about how American tax dollars support the abuse of Palestinian children in military detention. The title of the bill is Promoting Human Rights by Ending Israeli Military Detention of Palestinian Children Act, H.R. 4391. We have the letters. All you have to do is read it and sign it with your address. Our representatives want to know that you live in their congressional district, and we will mail them for you. We right now have 30 co-sponsors with that bill but there are none from New York, so let's change that in 2018. We can get our representative to co-sponsor. The second thing we're asking you to do is to send a birthday wish to Shadi Farah. Shadi had just turned 12 years old when he and a friend were standing at a bus stop waiting for the bus. They were taken into Israeli police custody in December of 2015 because some Israeli settlers complained Shadi and his friend looked suspicious. Under interrogation and torture, Shadi confessed that he wanted to stab a soldier. No actual stabbing or attempt at stabbing had ever taken place. Yet he and his friend were charged and sentenced to three years in detention, and they are still in detention now. Shadi's birthday is tomorrow, November 5th. His mother wants us all worldwide to remember him. You can learn more about Shadi and other Palestinian children in Israeli jails at the website nowaytotreatachild.org. 
So just remember that, nowaytotreatachild.org. We would love to have you sing him happy birthday, record it on your phone, and email it to the coordinator of human rights defenders in Hebron. They will see that Shadi's mother receives your greeting. We have both the notes with the email address. We have little, it's, we're on the same table as our wreaths this morning. This little note will give you the email address to send your greeting. You don't have to sing if you don't want to, but you could. And you can um, just sing, a, just say happy birthday, you are not forgotten. And we have the letters ready for you with an envelope and we'll put the stamp on. It's really worth it. We need to communicate, we need to let people know these things matter in this world. Thank you. Thank you, Leah May. And there's one more thing we can do. We can pray. We need to pray because that's how hearts get changed, is by prayer. And we do come to a time in our service where we do have opportunity to uh, share with each other joys and concerns and God sightings. We've already had one God sighting, the gift of the candle lighters from our brothers and sisters in Bethany, which was an absolute joy for us. And we need to continue to pray for the folks at, who once worshipped at Bethany. Other joys, concerns? Jane. Hi. Um, thank you all for praying for my brother Tom. Um, I think prayer is working in his life even though he is not a believer. Uh, the latest update with Tom is he's adjusted well to his post-surgical uh, challenges. And he is facing a big decision this week whether to um, do nothing more, um, whether to begin chemo or whether to go into a clinical trial. So if we could pray for Tom and the decision that he has to make. Thank you. Thanks, Jane. Jim. I have a joy I'd like to share. I know you all heard about how well uh, Friday night went and how well the sponsors did, but for me, it was watching this whole process happen and how so many of you came together to do bake goods for the bake sale or to bake pies or to help setting up. And then for those of you who came and attended on Friday night, it's just the spirit keeps being more abundant as opposed to scarce. So for me, it was a great joy to watch the whole thing happen and to be part of Friday night. So should all thank God and thank yourselves. I think it was a real joy because I actually knew the music, you know. I don't know the music these days, so. Um, for those of you who don't know, my husband just recently deployed again. Um, we just kind of kept it on down low because the kids and everybody were having a rough time. But I just want to thank everybody um, for checking in and um, for being so supportive. It's been a real blessing to have everybody um, in our lives here, so thank you. Great. Others? Pam? Well, I know you're just a... Is this on? Yes. Oh. Um, on behalf of the shepherds and the shepherdesses, I thank you so much for that gift of the, of the two matching, short, shortened um, candle lighters. You saw how easy it was for the children, much easier than the big funky one we had. And Deb doesn't have to order any. <laughs> Let me put in a petition for that. And I'm sorry I missed the uh, gathering at Friday. I was visiting my daughter in uh, Santa Fe. We had a wonderful visit. And New Mexico is gorgeous. But then it's great to be back among my friends. Thank you again. Thank you. Others? I would also like to share my joy with you. It's very awesome now I get my wife with me from Ghana. So it's like very exciting. Others, joys, concerns, prayer requests. Choir? Mm. Lindsay. I was really saddened to have missed Friday nights because the last time we came, it was an incredible time. But we went to a concert in Utica to hear Mercy Me. 10th Avenue North and Tim Timmons, and it was a phenomenal, God was in the room kind of a concert. Pete and Kathy went with Dan and I, and it was just awesome. Cool. And if, for those of you who don't know it, Mercy Me was the one that, in the movie, I can only imagine, that they had at the theaters a while ago, story about his life. 
but check him out. He's just phenomenal. Good. Thank you. Anyone? Yes, down here. Ori? Yes. She had a pancreatectomy uh, in the last year, and they told her she didn't have to come back for six months, but she just went the other day, and they want her to go back again. So I just, she's only 22, and it's hard to see her struggling so much. And her first name again is? Eleanor. Eleanor. So prayers for Eleanor, please. Thank you for sharing. Others? Don't want to miss anybody. I think the sun is coming out. I, you know? Don't get too used to it, though. <laughs> Let us join hearts and minds together in prayer. Gracious God, thank you. Thank you for the day that you gifted us with. God, it really doesn't matter if it's raining, if it's snowing, if it's cloudy, if it's sunny. We all have our preferences. But the biggest thank you is that you are with us no matter what the weather is like. You are with us in the clouds and in the sunshine and in the rain, in the wind, in all of nature. The master artist, especially this fall, it has been incredible. We are just in awe of your artistry. We are in awe of your majesty. So we stop and we give you thanks. And we give you thanks, God, that you ordained a day, a Sabbath, a day set apart for worship, to worship you to worship and praise you, for us to remember who you are and who we aren't, to give you thanks and praise for everything. We thank you that you have gathered us under this roof to hear your word proclaimed in, in testimony, in song, in scripture, in sermon, and then again, as we leave this place, this place of sanctuary, we go back into the world that you created to bring the good news of your Son, our Savior Jesus, to friend and stranger alike. Doesn't get any better than that, God, and we give you thanks for that. God, we have lifted joys and concerns, shared and held. We are thankful for the good days, and we are thankful that in the days where we struggle, you walk beside us, you hold us ever so close. So in our time together, as we learn about, out of all the rules, the two that are the most important, loving you, and loving our neighbor. May we see in fresh eyes ways that we might be able to do just that, to love you with heart, soul, mind, and strength, and neighbor in kind. So God, for this day, we give you thanks. For your Holy Spirit, we give you thanks. And we give you thanks for your Son, our risen Savior, Jesus. And in the words of Jesus, we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
The scripture lesson for this week comes from Mark chapter 12, verses 28 to 34. Just for a little context, we start in the middle of a section where uh, some of the scribes were uh, questioning Jesus. And one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another, and seeing that he answered them well, he asked him, which commandment is the first of all? Jesus answered, the first is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said to him, you are right, teacher, you have truly said that he is one, and there is no other but he. And to love him with all the heart, and with all the understanding, and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself is much more than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus said that he had answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared to ask him any question. This is the word of the Lord. I invite us to be in a spirit of prayer. Loving God, we give you thanks once again for this day and time together. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. God, I ask the Holy Spirit would come upon these words, transform them if necessary, transform our hearts to receive the word that you have for us today. And then so empower us as we leave this place that we will be in power to share the good news of your Son, our risen Savior, Jesus. And it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There's Dave Simmons. Dave Simmons, your article about me in the newsletter has caused a lot of um, questions. Okay. The biggest question is... What does your license plate really mean? (laughs) Out of all the questions, that's the biggest one. What does your license plate mean? My license plate says G B Pack Fan. Green Bay Packers. Yes. I got that just before. I I was in uh, Philly Evans Mills, and I decided that I had enough money where I could get one of those vanity plates. So I went online, and I tried to figure out how I could do that in eight letters or less. So that's what I came up with. About two weeks later, after the plates came and they were proudly displayed on my car, I got a call from the district superintendent and said, you're moving. I said, okay, not real happy about it, but you're moving. Okay, where am I moving? Well, you're going to move to Palmyra and Manchester. Okay, I think I know where that is. And as I pulled into the Palmyra parking lot, I said, oh my gosh, I'm in Bill's territory. (laughs) What are they going to do to my car? Nothing. They did nothing. And we had eight wonderful years together, especially this time of year. I am a Green Bay Packer fan. I mean, who in their right mind in the North Country or anywhere in New York State would emblazon that on their license plate, really? Especially when you're down in Buffalo Bills territory, let's face it, you know? Stationed in Madison, Wisconsin during part of World War II, I am assuming that is where my dad began his love affair with Green Bay. Now, growing up in the 1950s and the 1960s, it was easy to be a Packer fan because, you know, they don't call Green Bay, Wisconsin, Titletown for nothing. Because I did have the opportunity to go to Lambeau Field, and you will see all the titles emblazoned on that stadium. It is just a sight to behold. But then came the 70s, and then came the 80s, and that was really tough. But then in 1992, things began to turn around a little bit when they um, hired this unknown quarterback named Brett Favre. Has anybody heard of him? 
Well, things kind of turned around then. I always joke with my father when he was alive that he was more interested in Super Bowl I than my birthday because they coincided on the same day, January 15th, 1967. On my 15th birthday, Dad watched Super Bowl I, I think. I don't remember, and neither did he. But I have successfully gotten that bug for Green Bay, and I have successfully passed that along to both my grandchildren and my, grand, and my grandchildren. And we wear our colors proudly, whether we win, where's Martha, or whether we lose, we'll find out Monday morning, won't we? Yes, we will. Football is a complicated game with rule changes that I have to say I don't understand all the time. Then there's all that high-tech gizmo stuff. Drones now, they can scoot down and take pictures right on the field. And little did I know, quarterbacks have radios inside their helmets, you know, to get their plays and everything. And I thought, what happened to the good old days? You know, the good old days where they made it up on the fly, you know, like Bart Starr at the Ice Bowl. I mean, what happened to that, you know? I just don't understand that. And if you go to a game, you see all the jumbotrons, and you feel like you're on, you know, the 50-yard line front and center. And if you're at home, we get the advantage of that school bus yellow line, you know, down the middle so we can tell where all the, you know, the first downs are. But the object of the game, even after all of this stuff, the object of the game has not changed at all. One team tries to make forward progress toward the opponent's goal line. Jesus was in Jerusalem for the final time. The palms waved as Jesus triumphantly entered Jerusalem, now gathered dust on the ground. Shouts of Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, were but a distant memory. Now Jesus faced the scribes, the Pharisees, and the religious leaders in a match that rivals last year's Super Bowl. The goal of the religious community was to trap Jesus, to get him to say something that showed he was out of bounds so that they could arrest him. They started, and if you want to keep this football theme going, they started on their own 20-yard line and threw Jesus the question, is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay them or shouldn't we? Well, Jesus saw through their play, reminding them to get to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give to God what belongs to God. One could say the religious leaders were incomplete. Now, second and ten, the Sadducees tried to tackle Jesus by asking a question concerning whose husband a multiple married widow belonged to in the resurrection. Again, Jesus called them out on their lack of biblical knowledge. One could say also that the Sadducees were incomplete. So now we're down to third and ten. The religious leaders needed to make forward progress or the ball would go to Jesus. So while they're huddled and strategizing, another religious leader stood on the sideline. Throughout that last series of Down, he listened intently to the questions his counterpart asked, along with Jesus' corresponding answers. Surprising himself, he found that he was on the side of the visiting team. He was on Jesus' side. So he asked his own question not to trap Jesus, in order to arrest him, but he asked his own question out of a thirst for an answer to a question that bothered him deep to his soul. He said, of all the commandments, 
which one is most important? So, time out. It would be good to understand that the Old Testament consisted of over 600 laws, rules, and regulations, and each one established to help God's people live in relationship with God and others. The religious leader asked Jesus what appeared on the surface a trick question. How do you choose from all the laws, all the rules, all the regulations, which one should Jesus pick? Well, Jesus didn't bat an eye. He said the most important commandment is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Our Jewish brothers and sisters call that the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Worship of God was, is, and will always be the most important of all the laws, rules, and regulations. As one of my commenters said, commentators said, worship is essential not only because we recognize who God is, but also because it sets the agenda for who we are called to be. If we're made in, the, in God's image, as the Old Testament tells us, then we will find our true position and purpose in life only when we learn to love and worship the one we were designed to reflect. Friends, if we want to make forward progress individually reflecting God's image, our entire collective effort each Sunday morning must be focused solely on the worship of God. Each song we sing, each prayer raised in faith, each scripture proclaimed, each message offered must be in response to God's greatness and God's holiness. Now, thankfully, God does not look for intricate prayers. God doesn't care if you use ten-syllable words or one. God's not interested if the hymn comes from the hymnal or the faith we sing or out of the uh, Orange Voices of Praise songbook. You know why? Because God's interest lies in the heart. Do you mean what you say, what you sing, what you pray? what you preach. While preparing for this message, I read the following. It said, worshiping God isn't just a head trip or about coming up with more technological gadgets for Sunday morning to put more people in the pews. It's about putting our whole selves passionately in the game. The teacher of the law asked Jesus for the greatest command, which implied he only wanted one answer. Well, Jesus gave him two. Well, why? Because the two were inseparable, like what I tried to tell the kids this morning. That the two sides of the coin are equally important. Jesus said the second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. No other commandment is greater than these. So why do you come to church on Sunday morning? Why do we, in northern New York, climb out of warm beds into cold cars to shiver, literally, all the way to 327 Franklin Street? Well, pastor, you might say, didn't you already answer that question? We are here to worship God. Well, of course. 
But there is more. I hope that the worship of God inspires us, feeds us, challenges us. The worship of God prepares us for what's to come, maybe in the next hour, maybe in the next day, maybe sometime that next week. Since most of us don't live in isolation in some distant cave, we will come in contact with fellow travelers on this shared planet in the next 168 hours that make up a week. Some of those fellow travelers we will know as family. Some we know as next door neighbors and friends. Some we will know as colleagues or at work or fellow students at school. Some we will know by sight, the bank teller, the grocery clerk, the mail carrier. Some we will know if we make the effort, the customers at the Impossible Dream Thrift Store, the folks looking for assistance at the Salvation Army, a single mom or dad at the food pantry. You see, friends, my prayer is that the worship of God each Sunday compels us to go outside our individual and collective comfort zones and the safety of these four walls to be the hands and feet of Jesus wherever and whenever Jesus calls. Someone much wiser than me said this, if we're following Christ... Our success is measured not only by how our love for God transforms us, but by how that love finds its way through us to someone else. Time and again, Jesus coached his disciples by saying that their love for God would be measured by the love they showed to others, particularly people in need. We know at times football is a game of inches and a game of, and a game of yards. Football is a, is a team of single-minded folk who work together to move the ball one yard at a time toward the goal. That's forward progress. So perhaps the question we need to chew on this week might be, in my personal and communal walk with Christ, am I, are we, making forward progress? Let us pray. Gracious God, Holy One, so much thanks and praise to you. May we chew on your words this week. May we recall the Shema every day. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. May we love you with all our heart, soul, mind, strength, and neighbor in kind. Amen. As we prepare ourselves for communion this morning, I invite us to remain seated as we sing from the faith we sing, number 2254.
I was checking with Kathy about what the name of the anthem was, which was wonderful. It's called The One. But the phrase that I remembered was Feast of Love. Feast of Love, does that not represent what is here today? Yes, who said that? Thank you. That's an amen. It is a feast of love because it was love. Love that God had for us that brought Jesus to earth. That brought Jesus fully divine and fully human at the same time to understand all the struggles that we imperfect people have. Feast of love. That on the night that he gave himself for us, he took something so common from table that everybody would understand. Because no matter what ethnicity, what country you're from, bread is the common denominator. It might not look like this. This is Altieri's Italian bread. I don't know. Where's Olivia? I don't know if it's up in Canada yet or not. But bread is the common denominator, which means Jesus is the common denominator. And he took the bread and he gave thanks to God. And he broke the bread and he gave it to his friends. He said, take and eat. This is my body given for you. And every time you do this, remember me. And then later on in the meal, Jesus took a cup made from ordinary grapes. The wine was ordinary. The cup was ordinary. But when he gave thanks to God, that whole thing became extraordinary. And then, you know this is my favorite part, he gave it to each person that was there. Every single person was offered this cup, which meant Judas was offered the cup. It meant Peter, the one who denied, was offered the cup. It meant Thomas was offered the cup. And John and everybody else. And they talk about it wasn't just Jesus' 12 that was there, that there were others gathered in that upstairs room, even women. Women were offered the cup as well. No one was denied access to the cup. No one is denied access to Jesus. And Jesus said, drink this all of you. This is the cup of the new covenant, the new relationship poured out in my blood for the forgiveness of sin. Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, we give you thanks and praise for this day and this time together. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. And we pray and ask that the Spirit would come down upon us once again and on these gifts of bread and cup. Make them be for us, the body, the blood of Christ, so that we may be for your world, the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. And by your Spirit, God, make us one in Christ and one with each other and one in ministry to your entire world until Christ comes back and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, our risen Savior, Jesus, we offer honor and glory now and forever. Amen. Today we are going to have communion by intinction. It's a fancy term, isn't it? It just means that at the usher's directions, if you are able, you will come down and you will be offered, you will take a piece of bread from the common loaf and you will be able to dip it in the juice. And I'll be standing over on the side if you want to pray with me or you're always welcome to pray at the rail. Now, you will also notice that the offering plates are there. You don't have to pay to come down here. That's not what we are all about. We are about offering ourselves 
and our gifts to God and being thankful when we come to have the bread and the cup. So you are welcome, and I know my finance team always gets nervous when I tell them that it is strictly voluntary, but that offering is between you and God. Because our offerings are part of our worship and praise of God. So at this time, I would invite the communion servers to come on down, and I would be privileged to serve you first. And Helen, Helen, I'll come up to you if you like. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll come up to you, okay? You just, you just have a seat. Um, we need a fourth. Who would, Jane, come on down. Lindsay, the body, blood of Christ for you. Ben, the body, and blood of Christ for you. Dab the body of blood of Christ for you. And Jane, the body and blood of Christ for you. Let me go serve Helen. Body and blood of Christ for you, Helen. Let us pray. Gracious God, you have offered yourself to us, and we thank you for that. We thank you how you feed us in so many ways, not only physically, but spiritually, emotionally, mentally. We are just so grateful. So God, as we leave this place, this sanctuary, May we continue to be your hands and feet. And we give you thanks and praise in the name of Christ. Amen. Our final hymn is in the black book, More Like You. I invite us to stand as able.
please join me in the sending forth as printed in your bulletin. Friends, go with a tender and grateful heart. We remember the baby the only God. In all you do and in all you say. You are blessed by the grace, love, and friendship of our Creator. We, we now, now go to be a blessing in the world. Amen. You may be seated. serve. This has been a broadcast of the 1015 service Sunday morning from Asbury United Methodist Church located on Franklin Street in Watertown. Asbury United Methodist Church.